Scripture reading this evening is from the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verses 1 through 7. That's Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 7. And I'll be reading out of the New King James. Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling sweet aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous, covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers within them. Good evening. Well, in paying attention to the uh, announcements this morning that Tim gave, even Tim, we were talking about at lunch today, uh, he even said himself that reading through all, especially the people out of town, he didn't think he was ever going to quit reading the list of people. We basically have a small congregation that are gone, and I guess I keep forgetting that it's uh, kind of the spring break, Easter break, whatever you might call it for schools and so forth, but a lot of people, a lot of people that are out of town. And, uh, and then we've had quite a few people that are, uh, that are ill, that are not feeling well uh, also. But uh, glad that you're able to uh, be here tonight. And um, what I want to do this evening is really going to be a lesson that will supplement the lesson that I dealt with this morning. And in the lesson this morning, you'll be reminded that was titled that what sin will always do. And it talks about the direction of sin and what sin will take us. And even as making the points that sin will always take you farther than you want to go and sin will always keep you longer than you want to stay. And finally, that sin will always cost you more than you want to pay. And as I was preparing for these lessons shortly before I left the meeting uh, here a couple of weeks ago in preparation for all of this, trying to be ready because we knew we would not be getting back until sometime on Saturday, I thought, well, it's kind of a double whammy, if you will, of dealing with, with sin, but that's okay because I thought that they would be a good supplement to, to each other. And so we will take to heart that uh, God's word gives us great warning about the danger of the problem of sin, even as we talked about this morning, but now as we want to talk about controlling your life, and that's exactly what I am suggesting in this lesson is take control of your life as all of us, each and every one of us, must take control of our lives. Uh, there's going to be a couple of passages that I'm going to use tonight that we use today, uh, particularly um, what James had to say about sin, and we're going to go there in just a moment. In fact, you might want to go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 1. We're going to be reading verses 12 through 16 in just a few moments in James chapter 1. In the past years, and I've used this by way of illustration at various times in the past several years, we've been here for a little over 24 years now. When we go back to the days of Bakersfield and Clint was in first grade, all I can tell you is that that's history. That's, that's, in fact, it's getting to be, I won't say, I won't call it ancient history, son, but I tell you it's a lot of history because what are you? You're about six years old in first grade, I think it is, about six uh, Clint being a September baby, actually, he was five years old when he started first grade, turned six years old. But I take you back to Clint's classroom, Mrs. Arabidi, in first grade in Bakersfield. And I'll never forget, because Vicki had this to share with me, uh, of course, uh, Clint would, would come home from school, and school had just started. Just started. It's the new school year. It may have been the first day. It was certainly within the first week. And Vicki, as she would always do, and I think mamas have a tendency of doing, you know, children come home from school, well, how was your day? And a lot of times, what did you learn? What happened today? Those kinds of questions, you know. And I think a lot of times that what we're used to when you ask a child to come home, well, what happened to school? What did you learn? And what do they typically say? Well, I don't know, or nothing. 
Right, nothing. I, that's true too. But it's usually, I don't know, nothing. I mean, you think, well, okay, I guess hopefully in time they'll get something out of all this. But this particular day, and again, it was the beginning of the school year, uh, Clint's classroom, Mrs. Arabidi is the teacher. Uh, Vicki had occasion, had opportunity in that year to go and actually be in the classroom a few times as a class mother from time to time and, and got to know Mrs. Arabidi and watch her in action. And just a wonderful, marvelous teacher. Very engaged teacher. But that day when he came home the first week of school and Vicki asked the question, well, Clint, how was school and what did you do and what did you learn today? And Clint said to his mother, well, we learned today that we are in control. That I'm in control. Now, this kind of took Vicki back. And even as when she first shared it with me when I came home later from the office that day and probably at dinner or whatever the scenario was, because, you know, we're always a little cautious if a teacher tells the class, you know, the students, you're in control. We always thought, you know, really the teacher ought to be in control. But that's not the context. The context is this. And Mrs. Arabidi wanted these children, Clint and all of his classmates, to understand that you are in control of the decisions you make. You're the one. There's no one you can't use as an excuse that because of your friend, one of your classmates tells you, go ahead and get out of your seat. Or go ahead and, and, and talk without raising your hand. Going ahead and, and acting or behaving in a certain way that you're not, you do not have the right to say, well, this person or that person or this student. That know what? You are in control of your own decisions. And if you're going to get out of your seat, it's because you decided to do that. Or if you're going to talk out of turn, that was your decision. But you need to learn what it means to be in control. Well, now, that's, that's a big kid's lesson, I think. And as I have used this in illustrations before, and some of you might remember that, I look at this and think of it from that standpoint, we would all do well to be wise first graders tonight, to learn the lesson of what it means to be in control. We are in control. God gives us the ability to be in control. And you know what we call this, what we, we, we refer to this as free moral agency. Are we not free moral agents? It's called volition. The power to choose. The power to make choices. And there's no doubt that we are influenced by people and circumstances. But do we not see from Scripture from the very beginning of time, God told Adam and Eve, you have to be in control of your life. Now sadly, Eve, she allowed the influence of Satan and his trickery and his deception to go ahead and do something that she should not have. But let me ask you, could Satan really make her do it? Could he? No. He can advise, he can suggest, he can entice but she was in control, and then what the scripture says in Genesis 3, that after she eats of this forbidden fruit that her husband did likewise, did Eve make Adam do it? Did Satan make Cain rise up and kill his brother? Did Satan make the thousands of people that seemingly must have been on the earth in the days of Noah where the thoughts and intents of man's hearts evil continually, so much so that God decides that he's going to destroy humanity. Were, were these people, they just didn't have any other choices to make all of these wicked, evil, sinful decisions? We know better than that. And regardless of what is believed or taught, even, even in the theological religious schools of Calvinism and predestination and so forth, I'll tell you one thing that we get consistently from, from Scripture. The truth of the matter is, is God has always given us the ability, the power, to make decisions and choices for ourselves. Now maybe we have a friend or a spouse or someone that's very influential in our lives. But we'll never be able to stand before God in judgment and say, well, the reason why I did that, the reason why I went there, the reason why was because of this individual. And God's going to say, did, let me ask you, did that work for Adam? What did Adam say, essentially? 
Well, Lord, it's the woman you gave me. Did that work for Adam? No. Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and a generation of people, all through the pages of biblical history and even right on us today, must learn this lesson. Take control of your life. We just don't have the right to offer these feeble excuses for improper behavior. And so we're reminded of what James wrote. Did you turn there to James chapter 1? Let's, look, start, let's just look at verse 12 beginning. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself, that is God, nor does he himself tempt any one. But here it is. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by what his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth Death, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Do you remember that I actually, about three quarters of what we have read tonight, but about three quarters that I used and briefly referred to in this morning's lesson of James chapter 1. Now we'll start backwards in verse 16 because he says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren, because how many people are deceived about this subject? And they want to give all kinds of excuses and excuse people. Uh, make the excuses of their sinful behavior because of other people or other circumstances, events in life. And I'm going to tell you right now that what the Bible is consistent about is we are the ones that make the choices. Furthermore, does James say that we can live life as Christians under the sun, life in this, in this setting, is James suggesting for the moment that we're able to live a temptation-free life? No, we know better than that. What did Paul teach in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13? That temptation is common to man. Take, take your Bibles and turn over that passage. I alluded to it this morning. We didn't really go over and read it or look at it. And I want us to look at it tonight. This is in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. Now verse 12 gives this warning. This is after Paul uses as an historical example the sin of Israel. And he wants Corinth to understand that don't allow the sin of Israel to be kind of the sin of the church as well. That Israel had been guilty of lots of different kinds of spiritual infractions, sin. And, and don't get haughty or arrogant, which we're going to address in just a couple of moments. He says in verse 12 of 1 Corinthians 10, look at this, verse 12 in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Therefore let anyone who thinks that he stands, take heed lest he fall. Now we all need to see the importance of that, the value of that. That if we become too haughty or too arrogant, and ever take on this attitude, where I'm in the place of the position, or I'm to that spiritual maturity, that I don't have to worry about it, Paul is saying, you know, when a man thinks he stands, you better watch out lest he fall. I think all of us need to get that lesson. And have we ever been there where just when we thought that we just really have, are dialed in on this, we understand and whatnot, and the next thing you know, something happens, we lose control of our temper, we lose control of our speech, or even lose control of our thoughts, and it may be something that only we and God knows. But then if we'll be honest about it, we'll think, Maybe I'm not quite as in control at times as I think I am. When a man thinks he stands, take heed, watch out, lest he fall. But now look at the next verse, verse 13. Verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. Now, you, we, could, we could brainstorm every imaginable temptation there is. In all the fields of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the big three. 
Uh, how many of you have been, so many, most of you, not all, but almost every one of you here, in some format have been through the What Should I Believe series. In lesson number three, What Should I Believe About Satan and Sin? And we even had that little test at the end of it. Mark, in fact, you went through it just not long ago. Mark Miller did. And I said, remember, there's going to be a test. And how is it that Satan tempts us? And Mark got it. He got it. It's the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, pride of life. You remember that? Lust of flesh, lust of eyes, and pride. When Paul says here, let no temptation, when it says this, or, or understand this, that no temptation has overtaken you, that is not common to man, he's saying everything you can imagine in the field of temptation will never be able to say, well, wait a minute, I've been tempted in a way that nobody else ever has and can't. Just, you can't relate to my situation. Oh, no, there'll be plenty of people that can. In fact, probably all of us. But read on. No temptation is overtaking you that is not common to man. God is faithful. That means you can count on him. He's trustworthy. You can count him. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. So we do our brainstorming. And we can think of every kind of temptation again imaginable. And here it comes in our lives because are we going to be tempted in this life? Yes. Regularly. Maybe we can even say daily. Tell me. Are there going to be situations where God will look at it and say, well, now in that one, you're just kind of on your own. There's no escape route here. God will always provide a way of escape. But what's our responsibility? Take control. Use the escape route. And, and there's just so many ways that we can look at that. That's why we need to be involved more in reading of God's word, studying and meditating upon God's word, praying about it. And when these situations come, to, to let our minds go back and focus upon the things of God, to think on things that are very pure and righteous and good and just and holy, as we're going to deal with that as well. We look at these kinds of passages, and now it begin, we begin to understand there's so many ways or areas in which we are to take control. Back in James 1, don't ever think that God doesn't tempt. God can't be tempted by evil. Neither does he tempt anybody to sin. God doesn't tempt us. The temptation comes from Satan, and Satan works on our own lust, our own desires. Now, how can we look at this? What, what's the applications of this? And in as much as this morning I talked about what sin will always do and where it will take you and how long you'll be there and what will cost you, in kind of the same way I want to make similar type of points. Oh, there are different points. Granted, because now we want to look at this from the control aspect. We've seen where sin will take us and what sin will always do. But now, how do we grasp this and how do we take control? And this brings us to the first point. We've got to look at this and there are going to be a lot of things in this life in which we'll say, I will not think that. You know what? I've made this point number one because I think this is where it all starts. It all starts with how we think, how we mentally process things. By virtue of what we see or hear or sense or feel, when we are exposed to temptation, to sinful practices or activities, the very first thing we're dealing with is a thought process. God made us as very mental, psychological thinking people, human beings. And I know that as all of us look at it, you know, we have different strengths and we have different weaknesses. We do. But as we consider this, we've got to take on this head, I will not think that. And, it, and the very first thing, there has to be thoughts of humility. You know, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. James says, and what? He will lift you up. Look at Romans 12.3. Romans 12.3. And Paul talks about something that we ought not to think. Romans 12, 3. Paul says, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. I will not think that. That's the control we need to have. 
that I will not think that I am higher, more important, more whatever than others. Not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think. Humility is such an important principle that we need to wear. We need to garnish. We need to be adorned with humility. Remember what the wise man Solomon said in Proverbs 16, 18. Most of you can quote it. That pride goes before destruction of the fall. And a haughty spirit before the fall. As I've already dealt with in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Paul says, therefore let him who thinks he stands take it lest, take he lest he fall. Because there's the haughty, the arrogant spirit thinking this will never affect me. We ought not to think that way. I will not think that. What I need to think, what I need to understand is that I'm as susceptible to temptation and sin as anybody else. Now God has given me the means, the ways by which to avoid it. But let none of us ever think so highly of ourselves that we think, well, you know what? I'm just not going to be pr- uh, troubled or, or I'm, not, I'm not going to have the difficulty that everybody else has. I will not think that. It begins with humility. And then we go right into the kind of mind control that God wants us to place upon ourselves to control your thoughts, control your mind. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, there Paul's describing our warfare against sin and error, false teachers and false ways. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, in verse 4, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is physical. Soldiers of Christ arise, we could sing that song, but that doesn't mean that we're taking up armor and weapons, literally. The, he says that for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, and the pulling down of strongholds, look at verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. A lot of that have, could have to do with the false teachers and, and the work of Satan that was trying to produce uh, thoughts and teachings that were totally antithetical to the pure, true doctrine of Jesus Christ. But here's what Paul says. Look at the end of verse 5. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Yes, our lives are to be, we are to be captive to Christ. Our lives how we live. We are to be captivated by Christ. But not only are our, 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 our lives to be captive, our thoughts are. Look what it says again at the end, bringing every thought into captivity. The word there, eikmalatizo, by the way, is what he uses, eikmalatizo. And it's a very interesting word because it's only found about five times in the New Testament, but it's the idea to prisoner to incarcerate, to bring something into captivity. And sometimes it's used in a negative sense, and here it's actually used in a very positive sense, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You see, those things that we ought not to think, that I will not think that, can only happen when we allow our thoughts to be captivated by Christ. That we need to have our, the way we think, the way we mentally process, when we just deal with the issues of life day by day, if our thoughts are brought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, when these issues or situations come up, then we're prepared to deal with it and we'll make better choices and decisions. It is to captivate one's mind. Humility and allowing our thoughts to be brought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. And so take control. And what does Paul say in Philippians 4.8? Think on good things. Remember that passage in Philippians 4.8? He says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report. You look at those, in fact, a few years ago when we had the lectureship with the young men through the training program, this is what was preached on in that weekend. Do you remember that? And we divvied up this verse in every one of them. They took these particular concepts. These are beautiful thoughts. Things that are true and things that are noble and things that are just and things that are pure, things that are lovely and things that are good report. If there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, think on these things or some translations say meditate on these things. When it comes to wicked, evil, bad things, I will not think that when I am thinking on these good things. 
Take control of your life. I will not think that. Well, we leave just the mental processes, and then we come to one of the big, big challenges. How about I will not say that? <laughs> I will not say that. You know, the mind thing's very tough, and a lot of times, aren't we glad, and I say this in a kind of an interesting, accommodative way when I say aren't we glad, there are times that we think certain thoughts that we're really, very, really, really glad that nobody else knows what we're thinking. Do you know what I'm saying by that? But the fact of the matter is, who is it that always knows what we're thinking? God does. But there are times when, oh man, and thoughts that we have and say, I wouldn't want my spouse to know that I've thought that, or my brethren to know I've thought that, or somebody. But then here's what happens. When we don't control the thought so many times, then where do those thoughts next end up? They end up becoming articulated. They come from the brain and then go right out the mouth. Who here among us have not said some things that we almost immediately regretted? To your spouse, to your children, to your parents, to your brethren, to some friends, maybe even an enemy. Think I should have never said that. In the scripture reading that Bryce did for us a little while ago in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1, this has so much to do, yes, with, with the way we think, but also the way we talk. Therefore, be imitators of God. Verse 1, Ephesians 5, 1, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. To begin with in verse 2, that controlled living includes really appropriate behavior, appropriate language, but we have to walk in love. We have to understand that everything that we do, everything that we do, I don't care if it's on the job or in school or whatever we do, our actions should come up to God as a sacrifice in a sweet-smelling fragrance. That's how it should be. In other words, we may come here and worship God and think, well, we want our prayers and our singing to go up as a sweet-smelling Savior of God, right? What about when you go to work tomorrow? And what you do in the job or what you say at the job, how does that come up before God? Verse 3, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be named among you as is proper among saints. But then when it comes to speech, verse 4, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. How many times have we thought we've said something cute or clever, but in fact it's, it's crude, it's inappropriate, and it's not edifying, and it comes across as something very, very carnal, as opposed to being very spiritual. Controlled living is going to include controlled speech and will refrain itself from these various kinds of impure speech. And not to mention the explicatives that can be used, that is cursing, cussing type of language. And, and certainly taking God's name in vain. And, and, and I, I've seen before, and I, don't, I think sometimes people don't, and, and our speech can also almost be portrayed on, uh, portrayed on a printed page. I saw some time ago, and, and, and it's not a member of this congregation, but I tell you again, the social media thing in Facebook is an interesting phenomenon to me. But there was an individual that I know who responded to something that said, and, and put on there, OMG. Now, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't that stand for an expression explicatively as, oh my God? Has that not become just a base saying of the world? Don't you think? I believe it has. I don't know if maybe people are just stopping and thinking, but, but you know what? We need to look at that kind of thing and say, I will not say that. Not verbally or even on the printed page or the internet page or whatever you want to call that. We need to stop and think. In fact, Paul said in Colossians 4, 6, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt that is, it is palatable, so that you may know how to answer every person. 
if you read something or see something that affects you and that, that, that maybe this individual is just trying to say that's very troubling, well, then say that. Say, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry to see that. That's very troubling. But let us not use the base expressions of the world. I will not say that. We've got to control ourselves. Take control. And when we're dealing with one another as brethren, what did Paul say in Romans 14, 19? Take control and speak godly and edifying words one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Listen to Romans 14, 19. Love this text in Romans 14, talking about just dealing with relationships. And even sometimes there's differences. We, there are some matters of judgment and opinion, even amongst members of the church. But whatever, even if you have a difference of opinion about some of those judgment areas, you know what? Don't be ugly about it. Don't be demanding about it. But look for things that, that pursue peace. Listen to it. He says, therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. It's like we talked about in the adult Bible class this morning. And I gave the example of Nero and the kind of emperor that he was. And yet, we're told in Scripture they were, Christians were not to speak evil of him and were to pray for him. And I don't care who the president is today. And you may not like the president from the standpoint you don't like his policies or you don't agree with his decisions. And you may think that he's taking the country in the wrong direction. And you know what? You have the right to that political belief. And I'm not talking about politics, but I'm talking about what we just will not say, must not say. But when we find ourselves speaking kinds of words that do not pursue peace and that are not edifying and we find ourselves going against actually what Scripture says, not to speak evil against these dignitaries, but to pray for them. We've got to decide if we're going to take control of our life or not. I'm, I'm passionate about that. It's got nothing to do with politics. You don't like him, don't vote for him. But let's be careful what we say. I will not think that. I will not say that. I will not do that. It's a control issue. I will not do that. And these next two points, just briefly, I want to revisit Joseph, who I used as an illustration. Samson was our main, main focus this morning, if you remember, the life of Samson and what was going on with he and Delilah and the Philistines. But I did allude back to Joseph. Joseph is a godly man. Joseph is a, is a man of faith. Joseph is a man, though, that finds himself time after time in very difficult circumstances. And yet here's Joseph making good decisions, doing the right thing. And yet he's put in some interesting opportunities. And we see this, that as he has become a servant, a slave for Potiphar, he rises in the ranks of this wealthy uh, Egyptian nobleman. And, 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 and he is made like the head steward of this very wealthy man, Potiphar. And Potiphar's made him like the number one servant. But Potiphar's going to go away on business, some trip, going somewhere. And you look in Genesis 39 and verse 7. In Genesis 39 and verse 7, listen to this very carefully. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast long eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what, uh, excuse me, look, my master does not know what is with me in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Let me ask you, did Potiphar have time and opportunity? Of course he did. But you know what it all starts with? I will not think that. And so now he's going to say, I will not do that. And what he does say is very appropriate, very true. This takes awareness and resolve. That even when there's time and opportunity and nobody else may will ever know about it. You know what Joseph's attitude was? I'm not going to, you know, Potiphar's been good to me, but more than that even. How can I sin against God? That needs to be our attitude. How can I sin against God? 
Oh, that we would have the hearts of Joseph, a heart of Joseph. It takes awareness. Peter states in 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, be sober-minded. You know this passage. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, lion seeking someone to devour. Does he want to gobble us up? Of course he does. We've got to be watchful. Take control and do the right thing. This is what we need to learn from Joseph. The Apostle Paul, when he talked about the grace of God in Titus 2.11 that brings salvation, and that's appeared to all men in Titus 2.11, he said, here's what this grace does and this grace teaches. In verse 12, and I really do like the wording of the NIV in this. It teaches us, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Take control. Do the right thing. And so I will not do that. And when time and opportunity comes for things that we know are wrong, we know they're wrong. Say no. But we've got to even go beyond that. I will not think that. I will not say that. I will not do that. I will not go there. I will not go there. Have you ever gone somewhere that you regretted going there? And that may happen a lot in life and just things that you may be disappointed. But have you ever gone somewhere and you really regretted because spiritually speaking, of what it was and what it did that you regretted that you went there. Probably all of us have. We go back to Joseph in Genesis 39, and after he has told Potiphar's wife that he's not going to do that. But she kept trying to entice him as the text goes on. And a little bit later on, just in verse 12, as a matter of fact, of Genesis 39, 12, He's back in, her situ- back in her presence. Potiphar's not home. And what does she do? She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me, but left his garment in her hand and he fled and ran outside. In many respects, what Joseph is saying is, is I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go there. He knew it was wrong. You know what I'm saying? Do more than say no. Leave. Leave. It's like a young person, maybe high school or even college age, invited to go to some party and and seemingly that it was going to be just a regular, innocent type of party, but they show up and what's there? And maybe the, 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 the alcohol is flowing and maybe people are using various kinds of drugs, whatever the thing is, or other kinds of activities that are going on. And maybe their intentions were fine, But you know what we need to discipline ourselves to do and say? I'm not going there. And if I have gone there innocently, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. Lest we become victim to traveling or traversing to the point of no return. And that's when it gets very dangerous. Solomon warned his sons about this. Solomon had a lot of experience when it came to relationships with women. Proverbs 5 is very telling. Proverbs 5 verse 3, Solomon says, For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey, and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end she is bitter as warm wood, a very, very bitter shrub. Sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable. You do not know them. Therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. Don't go there. We may look at that and say, well, these are some extreme situations. That sounds like the description of a harlot, and it is. But it can be more than that. It can be other than that, I should say. 
how many places and situations as Christians we just say, we should say, take control and don't go there. We must do everything we can to avoid the sinner's place. Remember the first psalm? We just had sermons dealing with the psalms. And Psalm 1 was one of the assignments. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in this path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate both day and night. The godly man... He's not going to go there. He's not going to walk there. He's not going to stand there. He's not going to sit there. He's going to leave. I will not go there. And then I threw this in as a last point because this is very much like this point, but I wanted to be a little more pointed with it. And that is finally, I will not watch that. And I'll tell you because of what we have and the ability from the movie theaters to television to, to the internet to whatever, Look what is available in the world today. And again, we've got to look at this take control of your life. I will not watch that. We know the problem of David. In King David, 2 Samuel chapter 11, he had many men out on the battlefield. It was a time of war. He goes out on the veranda of his palace. In a short distance away, He looks over on a rooftop and there is Bathsheba, no doubt a beautiful woman, and she's bathing. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. And so then he has his servants to have this woman brought to his palace. And even when he was warned that she was the wife of another man, David put his eyes upon something and kept his eyes upon something. He watched something that he just should not have, and he should have turned around and gone back into the palace. But he allowed himself to dwell on that which he should not, and it goes right back to that, I will not think that. We must resolve not to watch that which will cause us to sin. And it's a real challenge today, again, because of when you think of the media and what is available this day and age. You know what Job said? And Job was a godly, righteous man. In Job 31, 1, he says, I made a covenant with my eyes. I love that expression. What's a covenant? An agreement. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a girl, at a woman. Psalm 103 and verse 3. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. It shall not cling to me. These are the lessons that we need to learn. Take control and shun the lust of the eyes. And it must be as which are identified in these lusts in 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Take control and shun the lust of the eyes. I will not watch that. Well, interesting couple of sermons today. (laughs) It really is. Understand what sin will always do. And having understood that, I hope that we get these lessons that I will not think that, I will not say that, I will not do that, I will not go there, I will not watch that. And such resolutions are necessary to achieve the spiritual success, to achieve the acceptance of God in our personal lives, in our families, and in pleasing God in every way. And again, it it, it takes, it takes our willingness to get into our Bibles, to read, to study, to meditate, to pray, to associate and have fellowship with good people because we are living in a world that is just saturated with such wickedness. Take control. And God gives that ability. And the lesson is ours. You have the ability to make a decision to become a Christian tonight. If you've not, and we want to extend to you that invitation. 
You have the ability to repent of sin. And if it's just between you and God, nobody knows about it, well, then go to God and be fervent and sincere, but do the right thing. But maybe you need some help. Maybe you need some prayer. Maybe you, maybe you need to sit down and just talk with somebody to look at God's word and have that prayer. We want to help. If we can help you in any way. The invitation is extended to you this time. Won't you please let that be known as we stand and sing the song that has been.